another edition of the NPH Hour here on News Talk Saga 960 AM. I'm your host, Jason Tong. So this is episode number 10 of A New Undertaking. For first-time listeners, the layout of the show is pretty simple. I record interviews with people either currently or previously involved in the Canadian basketball community and let them tell their stories of life lessons through this amazing sport. The hope is that we educate, inform, and inspire. As we sit here today, we are just a few weeks away from the most Canadian basketball league in our country's history from getting back on the floor. And to say that this is monumental would be an understatement because the CEBL, Canada's newest pro league, is the only competition we have seen from a basketball perspective since the pandemic took hold in March of 2020. Since then, high school basketball has been stopped. Post-secondary basketball was canceled. The Raptors played their games in Tampa. The Olympic qualifier in Victoria has been postponed. And the Raptors 905 played in a bubble in Florida. But high school basketball was played in the majority of the U.S. The NCAA completed a season and championship with all but one of their conferences taking part. The NBA first played in a bubble and are now in the playoffs in what was otherwise a normal season. Basketball was played internationally in almost every country and currently basketball is being played in the U.S. with club and AAU scene going on. Literally the only place basketball was not played was Canada where it is our country's fastest growing sport and where the highest number of current NBA and NCAA players were born other than the United States. At first, most understood it was a safety issue. But when we started to see that the sport was being played safely elsewhere, while even outdoor nets were being removed here, many began to question why that was. And now, more of a spotlight is being directed onto the fact that one sport above all others has been treated very differently. One of Canada's best sports writers, Laura Ewing of the Canadian Press, penned a very poignant article on this issue this past week, getting the viewpoints of a number of athletes about the hardships they have faced in their sport, especially when preparing for the upcoming Olympic Games that could have been rectified if the same advantages that were afforded to the sport of hockey was also given to them. But we're talking basketball specifically on this show, and there's no one that I know that has had more high-level conversations about the return of basketball safely than the commissioner of the CEBL, Mike Morreale, who has become a de facto leader in the cause of this sport being played once again in the country where its inventor, James Naismith, was born. Just a few days ago, the CEBL was given the go-ahead to once again play in home markets spanning four provinces in a season That will last about six weeks, and the hope is that at some point, fans will be back in attendance. This is a huge win, considering last season the CBL was only given the okay to play in a bubble over a few weeks, and as you will soon hear, that almost didn't even happen. It is my belief that the return of the CEBL at the end of June will start a movement that will see basketball return to competition in all forms in Canada. But as you will hear, that will only happen if it is led by us, the Canadian basketball community, who must do it with the best intentions and with safety at the forefront. Because it is quite obvious that the decision makers in this country do not understand how much Canadians value athletics and all the positives that it brings to the well-being of the population. And for basketball in particular, it's a community that in many cases was hit harder than any other by the very pandemic that took this sport away for more than a year. Mike Morreale, Commissioner of the Canadian Elite Basketball League, after calling an audible to push the league start date back from June 5th to June 24th, Full systems go to get the league back on the court for a third season. Mike, starting a new league from scratch is a challenge. Doing it when two of the first three years happened during a worldwide pandemic is crazy. Now, we've all experienced some lows during these times. Was there any days that you thought that this would end the league overall? Um, there were moments, and not because of our doing. And I will say, you know, it doesn't just make us crazy to play through the pandemic. It makes us crazy to even start a pro league in Canada because you know, <laughs> a lot of things are stacked against you, right? And in uh, the pandemic, of course, really tests 
anybody. And if you don't have that infrastructure in place or don't have that business planning or don't have that common goal, you know, you can be ripped apart to shreds mm. and without even knowing it. So, so yes, there were several times, um, I guess last year, you know, we didn't receive our, our <laughs> ability to play a proven play to literally 90 minutes before tip off. So at that particular point in time, uh, and this is a story that, that no one knows except for Josh and myself and a couple other, you know, executives and, you know, running through my head and leading up to that, we've already, you know, been in training camp, already had guys in it, you know, for 14 days, some more than that uh, in quarantine. And we've gone through the whole pride. Everybody's good. The green lights there, we're going except the green light wasn't there. Uh, and, and it wasn't there, not because of lack of trying. It wasn't there because there were mistakes made on the other end, on the, on the group that you think would be the one that was directing us. But when you're first at anything and being the first, you know, pro league to return or first league of any kind to return in Canada, you kind of have to pave the way. So yes, they've been tremendously stressful situations. I would say equally as much this year, uh, but they subsided, uh, about, eight or nine days ago when we, when we got our verbal agreements, but you know, for the longest time we were told that I don't think it's You're going to be able to pull this off. You're not going to be able to travel. We're not going to do interprovincial travel. You can't play in home markets. You got to play in a bubble. And I just wouldn't accept it. I just, and neither would my staff. We just had a goal and that goal was to play back in our home markets. And we knew we could do it safely, but we also knew we had to, we had to finesse the situation. So you know, yes, we push back from June 5th to June 24th, all done with an eye on, okay, vaccinations going up, you know, case counts going down, what's your timing? It, it's, it becomes almost like math and arithmetic. Really, it really does. Um, and that's, that helped us. But don't forget, we pushed it back. We usually start around May 7th. Mm -hmm. We were going to start the 2021 season, May 14th this year. And then we pushed it. So we already pushed it back a week. Then we pushed it back to June 5th. Then we pushed it back to June 24th and all, all in that whole kind of timeline, we wanted to maintain the integrity of a, of a true season. So yes, we are playing a condensed version, um, but it's still, you know, 70% of a normal season. So it's, it's going to be nice to come back. Thank you for your honesty. Cause uh, I hate you with that question. Didn't tell you it was coming, but during the last 15 months, it seems like every decision made every from, you know, return to play to government financial support to travel restrictions, like you just mentioned, has hurt the sport at every level, like not not just the CEBL. From where you sit and everything that you see, why do you think that is? Well, you know, and it's not just you and I that want the sport back. Yeah. I think that's the misunderstanding from people in power and people in government. It's not just, <clears throat> pardon me, you and I, it's not just the ones that run leagues or commissioners of respective leagues or, or, or fans. It's, it's, massive segments of the community that are identified as, you know, immigrants or newcomers, or perhaps, you know, and I don't want to overgeneralize because that's unfair, but, you know, truthfully, when you look at the data behind, you know, who are basketball fans and what the favorite sport is amongst newcomers or ages 12 to 17, or who, who identifies as the, what identifies as the coolest sport, basketball is the sport. So it is the future sport, but I would argue it's also the current sport. And uh, hockey will always take precedent, but it takes precedent for a lot of different reasons. It takes precedent because there's a machine behind it and there are politics involved. There's no doubt about that. Um, I've seen it firsthand over the last 15 or 16 months working with government. And, you know, I'm not shy to say it, you know, basketball is a relatively new sport in terms of popularity, in terms of Canadians on the world stage. Um, and it doesn't have that political backing that adv advocacy that hockey does and hockey fans and in the sport of hockey and the, the sheer numbers and the investments that have been made in hockey over time um, really are politically strong decision-making uh, subjects for the government because they know more often than not, the majority of the people will agree with the decisions they're making and the benefit of a sport like hockey. It's not hockey's fault. It's just the way that the sport has developed. It's been invested in by the government and not just the federal government, not the provincial government, but more or less than municipal governments, truthfully. Yep. If you look at all the venues that have been built in this country, there are zero purpose built venues for basketball, zero. There are almost 8,000 hockey rinks in this country. Now, 
they're not all indoor rinks of spectator facilities, big size, et cetera. But the majority of rinks, actually all the rinks that are built, and this is kind of how I look at it, all the rinks that are built that we play in or that others play in that are municipal buildings that house NHL teams, OHL teams, CHL teams, et cetera, were built for hockey. Without a doubt, no questions asked. They weren't built for any other sports except hockey. Yep. So when we go to talk to you know these venues that are owned by the cities for the most part uh, and funded and financed by taxpayers, you know, we say we want to bring a pro basketball there. They're very excited. And then they ask what our needs are. And of course, our needs are court and nets and, and, and other things. And they always say, well, who's going to buy that? You're going to provide the court and nets. And I say to them, well, does the hockey team provide the boards and the glass? Like, I, I don't understand. Wow. I don't understand the, the disconnect here. Um, if, if this is a, you know, a taxpayer funded building that is for the community, shouldn't there be uh, an eye on having other sports represented? And, and it goes, it probably goes for volleyball and it probably goes for other sports that would want to call that a home. But if you're a hockey team, I can guarantee you, you're getting the ice, you're getting the boards, you're getting the glass, you're getting the major dressing room, you're getting the signage, you're getting the pouring rights, you're getting, you're getting, you're getting. So um, it's it's a battle. It is an absolute battle and it will change um, in, because I think people uh, in basketball and lovers of basketball and supporters of basketball will make a change. This is just the beginning and I'm not the first to try and advocate. I won't be the last, but I do believe that um, – that it will change, but pressure needs to be put. It, it really does because decisions are made based on public opinion and public pressure. That's the truth. Yeah. And I mean, I, I think what almost made it harder for the basketball community, especially for the kids I talked to is the fact that basketball was being played elsewhere this entire time. And it was great that we had a Raptor season, but it was just so confusing yep. that hockey could be played here safely and now with fans while the Raptors were in Tampa and our Canadian national teams are still in Tampa where we're going to have the Victoria qualifier, of course. But I mean, the NCAA played high school basketball was being played currently right now. There's basketball tournaments being played in the U S like nothing had ever happened. And I understand there are differences for vaccination rates and everything along those lines, but what have you heard and felt? from Canadian players in the CEBL that are seeing the same thing, that basketball is being played elsewhere, yet it's so hard just to get what's going to amount to, you know, a two month season here in Canada. What have you been hearing? Well, there's, uh, there's a great response in terms of, of a thanks for, for doing it for them. So in that respect, they're, they're very positive that we have done as much as we have done to make sure there is basketball and, and not just pro basketball, because we want to be the, the guiding light for amateur basketball and, and, and everything, everything else. And I think that's, that's the position we find ourselves in. Um, we're held to a little bit of a different standard because pro sports are not treated equally um, amongst each other, but also equally in comparison to amateur sports. So they're not funded like amateur sport is. And we're also, we're, we're lumped in with the NHL's uh, NBA's, the MLB's. We're not any of those. Mm -hmm. We're a Canadian league designed and made by Canadians played by Canadians and, and should be hopefully um, helped, you know, financially. And, and, the, and I, I have to clarify the financial ask that we've put in from the beginning has only been a loan. It has never been a handout. It has only been, Hey, if you can provide us access to capital, because all the programs you put in front of us, they do not work. And we've said they do not work for 15 months. And then we tell the province they don't work and they send this to the feds. And then we tell the feds they don't work and they send this to the province. And you just go back and forth and decisions aren't made. So, you know, I think for us to be able to, to put pro basketball back on a court and to really be, you know, headstrong and making that happen, players appreciate that. And um, it's still going to be eye opening. You know, we have Americans that are quarantining right now that are fully vaccinated. And they are stuck in a hotel room, fully vaccinated without any of the benefits that come with being fully vaccinated, right? So it's, you know, what are we doing here? Um, it doesn't make sense. And so we applied for modified quarantine. Um, we were denied. And obviously, the NHL was not. Again, is that a science-based decision? Or is that a public opinion-based decision? And um, I, I feel worse Never mind our, our league and our players. I feel worse for the Olympians. The Olympians that are literally having to train for the Olympics, the biggest event of their entire life, 
and have to sit in a hotel room for two weeks because they went somewhere else to get a meet in so that they'd be, pre be prepared. So yeah. it's uh, it's an interesting time, but it, it needs our voices and uh, we need to be heard and I'll continue to do it. And I know you will, and I know others will as well, but um, it's, uh, it's, it's good. We're going to move mountains. It's going to take some yeah. time. So I, I just want to get onto the kids portion of it. Um, you know, balancing the economy and education, health protocols, that's staring parents in the face every day, both you and I are our parents. Um, and considering your background in athletics, can you imagine what it would have been like for you in your high school years to lose a year plus of team sport? And, and, and you know, what, what effect that would have on you? Well, you know, as confident as I was, um, as I was young, wanting to achieve my goal, which was to play in the CFL and, and win a Grey Cup and all that other stuff, had I missed a year, I'm not sure that I could have um, made it out of that. I, re I really am. I mean, because when you're when you have the mindset that you want to be the best and you have these goals and you and the sport brings the opportunity to socialize and to get better in mental health and physical health and, and hopefully future financial health, you put all your eggs in, in that basket. So when that gets pulled away from you, that is a, um, I, I can see from a mental point of view, that is incredibly uh, difficult and incredibly depressing. Um, and, you know, because athletes are wired differently. Um, they just, their, their focus is on making sure they're, they can be the best they possibly can be. So when the opportunity arises, they can rise to the challenge. But if the opportunities are taken away from you, where does that leave you? So that's one of the big goals we've had. And that's why we fought so hard for the, for the bubble last year. And that's why we fought so hard to return this year, because we got to at least be seen as a guiding light to say, okay, wait, there's basketball being played in Canada. That means my turn is coming. That means hopefully I can get on a court soon because they're proving it can be done. And, and that's encouraging. And maybe, Hey, I want to be like that guy on the court out there. So, you know, we, we serve a, a, a bigger purpose than just trying to, you know, bring in revenue and, and run a league. I, I really believe we, we serve a, a, a big purpose to the community to provide that normalcy and for athletes to provide a, a pathway for them to, to get to where they want to get to. CEBO Commissioner Mike Morreale, thank you for joining me on the NPH Hour. More importantly, thank you and your team for being the only basketball played in this country over the last 15 months. I really want people to understand that. And, and again, like you had said, just, just being a voice out there and, and helping push it forward and, and build the basketball industry here in Canada. Yes, basketball returns to Canada on June 24th. The CEBL's full schedule can be found on their website with games carried live on the CBC Gem app, and some are airing nationally on CBC television. Next on the NPH Hours, some real perspective on life and basketball by a former Canadian NCAA athlete who retired at the age of 20 due to injury. But on his 22nd birthday, he just released his first hip-hop album online as he prepares to take his master's at Virginia Tech. Jonathan Cabongo is up next on the MPH Hour here on News Talk Soccer, 960 AM.